All right. Well, I'm going to call the Health Finance and Policy Committee to order. So, um, as as always, we'll ask members to keep your feeds muted and also guests, testifiers, staff, please mute your feeds and I'll use the raise your hand for members if you'd like to ask a question and then the um, CA, CA or the CLA will put your hand down. Um, so we should begin then with a roll call. Ms. Niedernhofer, if you would call the roll. Liebling. Present. Hewitt. Present. Schumacher. Schumacher, present. Ackland. Present. Backer. Present. Bonner. Present. Bierman. Present. Bolden. Present. Damon. Present. Freiburg. Present. Grunhagen. Present. Hill. Present. Morrison. Present. Munson. Present. Pryor. Present. Quam. Present. Ryer. Present. Schultz. Present. Wolgamot. Present. Quorum is present. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Niedernhofer. Quorum is present. Uh, so the next order of business is to approve the minutes of February 3rd, 2021. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative Damoth. So Representative Damoth moves approval of the minutes of February 3rd. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, if you would all just unmute yourselves and we'll vote on the minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes of February 3rd are approved. So um, we are just going to wait for one moment here for Representative Cleavorn, who's checking in in another committee, and then she will be with us, and we're going to be taking up House File 526. Okay, I am told that Representative Cleavorn is here. Oh, there you are. Welcome to the committee, Representative Cleavorn. So the chair will move House File 526 to be recommended to be re-referred to Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. So please proceed, Representative Cleavorn. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate the opportunity to be before you today. Um, with me today is Ms. Molly Crawford. She is the State Registrar of Vital Records, and she will be speaking to the uh, necessary changes in this bill. It is a technical change, and I ask the members to please support these changes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Cleavorn. Ms. Crawford, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Molly Crawford, and I'm here to testify on behalf of House File 526. This bill proposes two important changes for Minnesota Vital Records. Number one, it simplifies language. And number two, it secures access to legal certificates. This bill simplifies language so that it is easier to understand and easier to explain who is eligible to get a birth or a death certificate. The current law uses unfamiliar terms. It uses the words tangible interest to explain who's authorized under the law to get certificates. Tangible interest is really about the relationship between a person who orders a certificate and the subject of a vital record. The current law says that a certificate shall be issued to a person who has tangible interest in the requested record. This is a person such as a parent who buys a birth certificate for their child. Tangible interest causes a lot of confusion for people need certificates. The bill streamlines the concept of eligibility by eliminating 16 words from the law. So instead of using the current terminology, the bill would simply go straight to the list of all the individuals who are eligible. So 
Under the bill, we would simply issue a certificate to a person who is the subject of a record, a person who is a parent, a spouse, and so on. In addition to using plain language, this bill will make a second important change. It will tighten security for birth and death certificates. The bill eliminates the party responsible for filing the vital record from the list of people who are eligible to get a certificate. This means it would prevent people who file vital records, people such as a hospital birth clerk, um, medical records personnel, perhaps a midwife, or even our own staff in the vital records office from getting other people's legal birth certificates. Further, the bill would require attorneys not only to provide evidence of their licenses as they do now, but also represent the subject of the record or someone who is eligible under the law to get a certificate. House File 526 would simplify language and tighten security it would protect individual identities by preventing issuance of legal birth certificates to people who have no business need to have them. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Crawford. Um, before we go on to member questions, I'm not sure if you told us your position and you know what role you're playing, and I just wanna make sure members do know that. I'm sorry, um, I am the state registrar in the Office of Vital Records at the Minnesota Department of Health. Okay, thank you, Ms. Crawford. And, and I think you just got to this at the right at the end of your testimony, but I just wanted you to kind of explain a little more, if you would, kind of what the, you know, the, the, the state maintains these records, right? And these are records that are used for Maybe you could just kind of lay out what are they used for and why is it so important to protect who gets access to them? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, vital records are typically birth and death certificates. Uh, we also collect data on fetal deaths. But today we're talking about birth and death data and certificates under Minnesota Statute 144.225. So when a person is born in Minnesota or when they die, certain data is collected, demographic data, things that we would consider civil registration, as well as some health information. Um, this data is really important for public health, for vital statistics, and it's important in the form of certificates for families and for individuals. A birth certificate, for example, provides an identity document. It also um, may allow access to certain services and benefits, such as child support or public assistance or social security. Um, the law is also discussing or is about death certificates and that's proof of death. So sometimes for insurance, life insurance payouts and other uh, forms of services and benefits that might cease upon death. Okay, thank you, Ms. Crawford. Um, we've got uh, Representative Munson and then Representative Gronhagen. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for that testimony, Ms. Crawford. My, uh, I guess I have kind of two questions. Um, the the first one is around identity theft. I, I think that um, this may help to prevent identity theft by people uh, requesting birth certificates of those who uh, they're not, and uh, but. It, um, for people that may not have, I mean, will it also make it difficult for people to get birth certificates uh, for themselves? Is it uh, a harder, are we raising the bar that uh, for, for people to legitimately get their own birth certificate? And then the second one is around um, death certificates. My, my assumption is that after uh, we get through COVID, there'll be more inquiries about uh, cause of death but that would not impact this. Is that correct? That, that the information for cause of death for people in general is not gonna be restricted due to this proposed legislation? Ms. Crawford. Thank you. So it's important to note that um, death records are completely public. So all of the data on a death record, the name, um, who's the informant to provide information to a funeral home, and the cause of death is all public information. And we provide that data to anybody who asks for it. 
now. Um, so with COVID or without COVID, that data is shared freely. The important thing is, is that only certain people under el eligible under the law can get the legal death certificate, that document that's proof of a death that, like I said, can be used for benefits and services. Um, families generally get the legal certificates. And um, birth certificates are, are a different matter. Um, subjects use those as an identity document in many cases. Uh, they're necessary to get a passport and things like that. The bill would not make it more difficult for individuals to get their own birth certificates nor anybody who really has a business need to get them, like a parent or grandparent, uh, an attorney who's representing somebody. Even funeral directors, morticians can get death certificates under the law. We're not changing that language because oftentimes they're getting them for the families who they're serving. Um, this really just tightens security because the person who files the record, somebody working usually in a medical facility like a birth clerk, really has no need to get a legal certificate. They can get the data, we can provide them reports, all of those things, all of those needs can be met through non-certified documents or um, electronic data that we can provide. Does that answer? Representative Munson? Yes, Madam Chair and Ms. Crawford, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Representative Gernhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I got a question for uh, Ms. Crawford. The, um, you know, a number of years ago, I was on the Public Safety and Judiciary Committees. It's been a while. But at that time, a bone of contention that came up was whether parents or the children can have, uh, the children that were adopted can have access to the birth records of their, uh, of their uh, actual parents. Uh, you know, everything's written in legalese nowadays and I'm not a lawyer. Does this change that in any way? Because there was some strong opinions about that, that some parents didn't want the children to have access, some did and vice versa. It, 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 has, it fizzled out in the end, but can you speak to that? Does this change that in any way? Ms. Crawford. Let me ask a clarifying question before I respond. Um, Representative, are you asking if the adoptee, the, the, the child who's adopted can have access to their own record or to their birth parents' records? Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, it would be where the, ch the one that seemed to be very contentious was where the child wanted access to their birth parents uh, record and the birth parent did not want that done, if I remember right. Um, so my question is, does this any way change uh, the adoption laws that we have on the books in terms of privacy? Would that help? Ms. Crawford? Uh, thank you, Representative and Madam Chair. No, this does not change adoption records or adoptee access to uh, their own original record or um, birth family records. Representative Grunhagen, good. Thank okay. you. Okay, other questions? Okay, not seeing any, so. Um, with that, um, since there are no further questions, uh, Representative Cleveland renews her motion that House File 526 be re-referred to the Committee on uh, Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. Uh, since we're only roll calling bills now, no more voice, voice votes to move them out of committee while we're in the virtual world, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Vice Chair Hewitt. Aye. Hewitt, aye. Lead Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Act Representative Ackland. 
Backland, aye. Backland, aye. Representative Backer. Backer votes aye. Backer, aye. Representative Bonner. Bonner, aye. Bonner, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Bierman, aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Damoth. Damoth, aye. Damoth, aye. Representative Freiburg. Aye. Freiburg, aye. Representative Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, aye. Keel, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Representative Munson. Munson, aye. Munson, aye. Representative Pryor. Pryor, aye. Pryor, aye. Representative Quam. Aye. Quam, aye. Representative Ryer. Ryer, aye. Ryer, aye. Representative Schultz. Aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Wolgamont. Aye. Wolgamont, aye. 19 ayes and zero nays. All right, thank you very much. And I have to make a correction. It's the chair's motion since Representative Cleborn's not on the committee. So uh, thank you, the motion prevails and the bill is on its way to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, members. Thank you, Representative Cleborn and thank Ms. You, Crawford. Madam, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate your support. Have a great day. So uh, next up is House File 475, Representative Hewitt and Representative Hewitt will be moving to that the bill be uh, laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. So Representative Hewitt. Madam Chair, that is my motion. And thank you, Madam Chair and members. This is a pretty straightforward bill that touches all of us all over the state of Minnesota. What it's called is our CALS legislation, Comprehensive Advanced Life Support. This bill allows a nonprofit organization to train our rural physicians, advanced practitioners, nurses, paramedics to work together as a team. No time is this more important than now. The, the business of advanced life support is airway. And with COVID here, it definitely has been a, a challenge for us. What they're asking for right now is a 200,000 over the biennium over base. I have two uh, testifiers with me, Madam Chair, today um, that would uh, be able to give us a little bit more details on the program, Ms. Gill and Dr. Wilcox. All right, thank you, Representative Hewitt. Um, Ms. Gill, would you like to go first? Please introduce yourself and tell us uh, where you're from and please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you very much to the members of the committee for giving us this opportunity to speak. I am Ann Gill. I'm the executive director for the CALS program since 2019. I'm also a registered nurse in the state of Minnesota for the past 35 years. Um, CALS has provided education throughout Minnesota for over 25 years, um, as, and CALS is an acronym for Comprehensive Advanced Life Support, and we do provide rural emergency education throughout the state. Our exclusive curriculum addresses a broad educational needs of doctors, advanced practice nurses, and paramedics working in rural and sometimes quite remote emergency departments. Um, Many of the healthcare professionals who are staffing critical access hospitals have a family practice background and do not have a background or exposure to emergency medicine. We help provide that bridge. And we provide that through a unique program that's specifically designed for rural education where there's infrequent uh, emergency care experience and sometimes lack of specialized personnel. Our content is comprehensive. It includes not just trauma, but also cardiac, stroke, pediatrics, obstetrics, neonatal, and then of course, airway compromise and, and sepsis, which both have been critically important during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've observed over the past 10 years that there's fewer and fewer uh, family physicians and more advanced practice providers in the emer emergency departments. And we're finding that we're also providing more education to that population to help bridge the transition from advanced practice providers um, who are transitioning from academia into practice with their emergency medicine education as they don't necessarily acquire those skills um, within their schooling. Um, so we've also partnered with 
a nurse practitioner program with St. Scholastica, and we're looking to potentially work with other areas to help assure their graduates receive emergency medicine education for successful entry into the workforce in rural settings. Um, we're acutely aware of the stress on critical access hospitals and the availability of resources. And we, by providing this training, um, it helps make the critical access hospitals um, um, com provide those necessary uh, care elements for their communities. And that is only possible with the legislative grant that we have received in the past. Um, we currently provide education for about 57 critical access hospitals in Minnesota. There's about 77 total. So we feel that with expansion of the grant, we should have uh, financial resources to reach additional personnel as well as some of the uh, advanced practice practitioners. And I believe Dr. Wilcox has some additional comments to make regarding the program. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gill. And I do see one member question. I'm gonna uh, go ahead with um, our next testifier and then we'll go to questions if that's okay. Uh, so um, we have Dr. Wilcox, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you members of this committee for the opportunity to discuss uh, CALS with you. My background is one of primary care, family medicine. I went into practice in a small rural community, New Prague, Minnesota, 47 years ago as a family medicine physician after completing my postgraduate training at Hennepin County Medical Center. As I began my practice at that time, it became somewhat clear to me that there was a notable lack of training in emergency care management uh, in our rural communities in particular focusing on trauma, uh, major medical issues, issues of that type related to stroke and obstetrical care. So as a result, in 1992, I had the unique opportunity to develop uh, with uh, Dr. Daryl Carter and Dr. Ernie Reese, this concept of comprehensive advanced life support. And since that time, I've had the opportunity to be an instructor for the program and also have been a member of the board during this entire period of time. It is essential, I feel, as Anne has mentioned, that we continue to focus on providing emergency care to our rural communities using the resources they have available to them within their settings. And as a result, I really continue to fully uh, support this concept of training in the area of advanced uh, cardiac and uh, comprehensive advanced life support. I really do appreciate the support that the legislature has given our program over the years. And I continue to really appreciate uh, your focus in the future on ongoing support in, uh, in these initiatives. So once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today to testify to the benefits of CALS. All right, thank you, Dr. Wilcox. Uh, let's go to Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was wondering if the author could talk about the MSRB and you know, paramedics, the volunteer ambulance, all of these rural uh, entities, uh, I think uh, should be more uh, in the conversation when, when things are coming up and improving. And I just was wondering why the MSRB, it isn't through them so that they're engaged and coordinated and right there with the conversation uh, because there's a lot of feedback, I, I think from the different organizations that they uh, coordinate with and involved in training and have the meetings with that should be part of uh, at least uh, aware of and engaged uh, in this important task. So Representative Kwam, before we get to that question, you're kind of asking why we're doing it this way. I actually wanted to ask some kind of more basic questions just about how it is working. And if it's okay with you, maybe after we get some of that established, then we could go kind of go to your question to Representative Hewitt, if that's okay. So that, that is, thank you, Madam Chair. That is most appropriate. Okay, thank you. I was gonna ask Ms. Gill Maybe you'd be the one, or or Dr. Wilcox, whichever. But 
So my understanding from your presentation is this is a separate nonprofit organization that that focuses on this kind of training. Is that correct? And I, I, I so I wanted to sort of understand what what the entity is that that we're talking about here and how the money flows. So does it go through the EMSRB? That was going to be one of my questions. And why or why, why not? And kind of just more basics about what is the base that you're getting right now? Because I take it this is an ongoing grant that, and you, you did mention that you've got, I think you said 57 critical access hospitals that you serve. So can you just give me a little more of the basis there? Like, you know, I see Mr. Berg is here too. He can help with the money piece, but just explain the organization and who you answer to, if you would. Yes, the grant, uh, we are a, a nonprofit organization and the grant helps provide um, uh, a subsidy or a uh, reimbursement for those medical professionals that do attend the course. So it reduces the cost for the individuals, um, professionals. Um, we do work with the um, Minnesota Department of Health is manages the, the, the grant um, and so we work very closely with uh, that entity. Mike, do you, anything else you would like to add with that? With Dr. Wilcox? Yeah, really not. I mean, uh, what Ann has suggested uh, support-wise financially is exactly what we've been working with over the last many years. And again, really are appreciative of the fine uh, support that has come from the legislature up to this point. Thank you. Um, Doc, uh, Mr. Berg, did you have something you wanted to add? Can you fill us in on kind of what the base is and so on? Madam Chair, that's exactly it. The, currently through the health department base budget, this uh, the general fund base for this program is $408,000 a year. Um, you may remember this same bill that added $100,000 to that base passed the House in 2019, but was not included in the final conference. Madam Chair. Okay, right, Representative Hewitt. Now I'll turn to you now, and if you want to address Representative Quam's question too, that'd be great. Yeah, I can do both real quick. Uh, just so we understand where that money sits right now, it was moved out of the MSRB a few years back and now sits in the Department of Rural Health um, that who manages it, which makes sense. Um, and I wanna make sure everybody understands that this, this training is done at the site also, which is a big deal because it saves us a lot of money. We don't have to fly or to take all these people out of their rural hospitals. They do it and it's done at that hospital. Um, Representative Quam, the MSRB is somewhat involved in this, but it's more hospital based um, for the rural care facilities and medics are brought in. Um, and I, I have to testify to this personally um, and I'll full disclosure, Dr. Wilcox was one of my instructors. Um, but in 1992, when this program started, um, it made like night and day happen because I would go out to these rural hospitals to transport these individuals and we had to do stabilization before we could move them. With the new concept of CALS and coming out in their updated best practices, we don't see that anymore. These people are ready for transport. In fact, many times we can let the local ambulance with medics on them take these patients now because they are ready. So this program was a great investment in rural health and it, it's done wonders. Representative Kwam, did I kind of answer your question there or do you do need to a little bit more? Representative Kwam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, the main point was I want EMSRB very much involved in the discussions and engaged because of that relationship between uh, you know the different teams, and that I, I wanted to understand why it was uh, moved out, and so I th I think I can talk with with Representative Hewitt um, offline and and clarify. Just I I it, it I, I worry about uh, the right and the left hand not talking to each other. Thank you, Representative Quam. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Representative Hewitt. And thank you, Representative Quam. That's a great, great um, 
discussion to have. It's why we heard from the MSRB this year. We know there's some opportunities over there we need to work on. Mm -hmm. And they do talk. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, I believe, is on their medical director subcommittee, if I'm not mistaken. So he does do reports to the MSRB on this subject. Is that right, Dr. Uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Wilcox? Dr. Wilcox. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Stewart. Yes, I am uh, on the Medical Director's Advisory Committee for the EMS Regulatory Board, and I am a strong advocate, uh, Representative Quam, of having EMS more fully engaged in community health initiatives throughout the state. CALS being one initiative, but also doing uh, support of local public health through my uh, working with community paramedics and community EMTs. So I see in the future ongoing opportunities for partnerships between EMS and local healthcare organizations, especially in a rural setting, to provide this kind of support as a team uh, for citizens within our rural areas of the state. All right, well, thank you. So we're gonna go to Representative Ryer and then Gr Grunhagen. Representative Ryer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Ms. Gill or Dr. Wilcox, um, my question I think is quite simple. In getting the additional 100,000 a year, is the purpose to be able to then expand to the 20 or so critical access hospitals that you currently are not serving, or is there some other barrier to providing service to them, um, their interest, for example, or other types of issues? Dr. Wilcox? Uh, thanks, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I think part of the, ma the major problem is in rural hospitals, uh, the finances available for training and education is sometimes the first to be cut when it comes to their bottom lines. And if we had additional support financially, we could go to these 20 or so additional critical access hospitals to support them uh, by bringing to them CALS uh, with this additional financial support. It's a great question, and I totally understand what uh, the thoughts are about this. Representative Breyer, anything further? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just one quick follow-up. Um, so then this amount has been planned out and budgeted to be sufficient to make up the balance. Is, is that fair to say? Mr. Wilcox, Dr. Wilcox? No, I think I'm going to defer that to Ann. Are you uh, on board here, Ann? Where are you at with this? All right. Ms. Gill? Yes, um, in, in the past, actually, our, we're asking for a reinstatement of our funding um, back to the 508,000. Um, in the past two years, it was reduced down to 408 due to budget constraints, I, as it is my understanding. And so we're actually asking for a reinstatement of what was appropriated for this program in the past. Okay, and uh, Representative Grunhagen put his hand down, but I don't know if you still, do you still have a question, Representative Grunhagen? Oh, I, I, my question was about finances, but the thing is, is that I just want to thank Representative Hewitt for bringing this forward. It's obviously a key area. The problem is we're facing a deficit based on the November forecast. Maybe that'll turn around with the February forecast, but uh, it's being laid over. Maybe we can reduce some other areas so that he can have this even if we're based with a deficit. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for bringing it forward, Representative uh, Hewitt. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Representative Grunhey. And I have one final thing. You mentioned, Ms. Gill, that uh, the, this helps reduce the fees that the providers pay. So they still do pay for, for the uh, education, correct? And how do you determine how much they pay versus how much is supported through the grant? Is this just kind of adjusted based on what's available? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, the, um, it, it may depend on the hospital may actually do some of the, the payment for the provider, depending on the hospital or the individual provider may pay for it themselves. But we do have a um, a budgeted amount that we have predetermined that would be covered by the grant, um, depending on the amount of the grant. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, testifier. Seeing no further discussion, House File 475 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Hewitt.
So we will move on now to House File 569, Representative Morrison. Would you like to move your bill, Representative Morrison? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I would like to move House File 569. Okay, so uh, Representative Morrison moves that House File 569 will be recommended to be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. And uh, members, there is another bill as well that we uh, is not a, actually a filed bill yet, but we sent the language out to everyone that um, goes along with this discussion. So essentially informational only, but um, we, because of the uh, difficulties this session yet with getting bills uh, through the process and introduced, uh, we thought it would be good to talk about both of these at once. So, um, just hope to have a good general discussion and get an understanding of where the finances are with this. So with that, Representative Morrison, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members, I appreciate the opportunity to present these two important tobacco prevention funding bills that offer different ways to save, solve the same problem. Reducing tobacco's harm is a public health success story. Today, we all enjoy smoke-free air and tens of thousands of Minnesotans have broken their addiction to cigarettes. Unfortunately, though, our work is not done. As a physician and a mother and an elected official, I am deeply concerned about smoking and the epidemic of youth tobacco use. We were so close to raising a generation free from tobacco addiction. In 2019, youth cigarette smoking fell to the lowest levels ever recorded. E-cigarettes have created a whole new health crisis among our kids and young adults. And smoking rates remain high in communities targeted by the tobacco industry, including Black, American Indian, and LGBTQ people. Every year, Minnesota loses 6,300 residents and $7 billion to smoking. And with one in four Minnesota 11th graders vaping e-cigarettes, we face untold costs of future addiction. Decades of research have detailed the harms of cigarettes. Smoking harms nearly every organ in your body. That is particularly concerning as we navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Current or former smokers are at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. To make matters worse, communities targeted by the tobacco industry are some of the hardest hit by COVID-19. We do need to do more to reduce smoking and youth tobacco use, starting with investing more in tobacco prevention and treatment. As a part of the 1998 tobacco settlement, Clearway Minnesota was created. They have provided the vast majority of tobacco prevention and treatment funding in our state. Clearly, will, Clearway will sunset at the end of this year, leaving a significant funding gap. The time is now for us to address this cliff. Tobacco taxes and settlement fees are a huge source of revenue, revenue in Minnesota. Last year alone, Minnesota collected nearly 760 million dollars in tobacco revenues. Yet the state only spent about 1% of that total on tobacco prevention and treatment. That total includes our statewide quit tobacco services, which the legislature came together to fund in 2019. That was part one. Part two is Clearway Minnesota passing the tobacco prevention baton back to the state. We need to pick that baton up and not drop it. The two bills before you today would invest a small fraction of those revenues in preventing youth tobacco use and building a healthier state. There is a third funding option that has been referred to the tax committee as well. These bills provide this committee and the legislature with options for how to invest additional dollars in prevention efforts. The first bill, House File 569, would appropriate $15 million from the general fund annually to the Minnesota Department of Health to boost its tobacco prevention efforts. The second bill, which Chair Liebling referenced, does not have a house file just yet, and I appreciate your hearing it for efficiency's sake. This bill would dedicate a portion of the funds that Minnesota may recover from cigarette companies that haven't been paying their fair share of the tobacco settlement fees. A previous version of this bill was included in the chair's last omnibus budget, but unfortunately did not make it into the final one and my testifier will share more details on that case. Investing in tobacco prevention and treatment will help also help us combat systemic racism and tobacco-related health disparities. As you all know, late last year, the House Select Committee on Racism issued a series of recommendations on how to make Minnesota a more equitable and just state. 
one of their recommendations is to invest in a more robust and effective tobacco control program. These proposals would help us meet this need. Instead of spending just one penny of every dollar of tobacco revenue on prevention, we would be spending about two or three pennies. Looking at it this way, it's a tiny investment, yet that investment will pay dividends by lowering smoking rates, preventing youth addiction, and easing health disparities. With that kind of investment, we all win. Thank you very much for hearing these bills. I'll look forward to working together to find a solution to this funding gap. Thank you, Representative Morrison. Um, and there is one hand up, but I, I'd like to um, take testimony from Molly Moylanin, and then we'll go to questions if that's okay. So is that okay, Representative Munson? Or did you have a clarifying yeah, question? Yeah, thank okay, you. great, thank you. Okay, uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Moylanin. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Molly Moylanin, and I serve as Vice President of Clearway, Minnesota, an independent nonprofit working to reduce tobacco's harm. I also co-chair Minnesotans for a Smoke Free Generation, a coalition of more than 60 organizations committed to ending youth tobacco addiction. For the past 20 years, Clearway, Minnesota has led a comprehensive effort to prevent commercial tobacco use through education campaigns, research, frequent smoking help, and community partnerships. The legislature has been a strong bipartisan partner in these efforts passing smoke-free air, funding quit smoking services, and most recently, Tobacco 21. Our collective work has saved thousands of lives, prevented thousands of cancers, and saved Minnesota more than $5 billion. If Minnesota continues funding tobacco prevention at current levels or higher, we can save another 14,000 lives and 10 billion in healthcare costs. Clearing Minnesota was created as a life-limited organization and we will sunset at the end of this year. As we reach our sunset, tobacco remains a threat, especially when it comes to the youth e-cigarette epidemic and racial disparities. We are committed to working with the legislature on finding a sustainable solution. House file 569 is pretty straightforward and the second funding option deserves a little bit further explanation. Now, as part of the 1998 tobacco settlement, companies agreed to pay fees to the state. However, in 2015, there was an industry merger which resulted in the transfer of some famous brands, including Cools, Mavericks, Salem's, and Winston's. Since then, these companies have not paid their share of settlement payments. The state of Minnesota is suing to recover these commitments, and the parties are currently in settlement negotiations. Securing sustainable tobacco prevention funding, no matter how we do it, will create a healthier future for Minnesota. We are grateful for, to Chair Liebling, to Representative Morrison and lawmakers in both parties and chambers for exploring a number of possible solutions this year. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moylan. And, and just uh, to close the loop on this, if the uh, money um, comes from the settlement, from the lawsuit, and this bill is not in place, does that money, do you know where the money goes or uh, it just goes into the general fund? Is that the assumption? Chair Lee, that's correct. Okay, all right, thank you. We've got Representative Munson and then Representative Grunhagen. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this would be a question to uh, Representative Morrison or the testifier. Um, I'm in, in speaking with a group of police officers that uh, represent areas across southern Minnesota. It came to my attention that um, the Tobacco 21 legislation that passed recently um, actually legalized uh, tobacco use by minors, and where it was previously illegal. Now they're they're not able to enforce it when they find youth smoking, you know, across from the high school and such. Um, do you? I know that we're, this bill is actually, you know, spending more money on prevention, but uh, have you seen the impact of making it legal now for kids to smoke um, and how that's changed um, as far as enforcement and, um, you know, community awareness? So, um, Representative Munson, this is kind of outside the topic of the hearing, but uh, Ms. Moylan, and do you, can you respond to that? I know you're, you're so well versed in all these issues. Go ahead if you can. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Munson. The Tobacco 21 bill, what that did was removed penalties 
an underage possession and use and purchase. And that was intentional. As we lowered, as we increased the tobacco age in Minnesota and across the country, as supported by, um, by legislators across the country and Congress and the former president, that advocated for it, we removed penalties on underage possession and person, person, purchase and use. And because, and that was intentional, so that we wouldn't increase interactions between young people of color, especially, and law enforcement. Law enforcement across the state said, we don't need to have that anymore. Um, and we really wanna focus the penalties on, um, on the industry that is responsible for addicting uh, underage youth not have the penalties on the underage users. So that was that's a um, an answer more of a uh, answer to that question around Tobacco Twenty One. Okay, Representative Grunhagen. Representative, I'm having problems getting. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, and I just go back to, there was a tobacco settlement, so is what the testifier was saying, and I had to step away for just a minute, I apologize for that. Is that money completely gone now, and it's in uh, litigation, waiting for settlement? Um, or is it, uh, or what's the status of that tobacco money? And again, I'm all for, uh, you know, regulating uh, addictive products, uh, like tobacco, the uh, the only thing when I was on the school board, and I know some of you are sick of hearing that, but the um, you know we had a couple of programs, Quest and Dare, and I used to ask for credible evidence that they actually worked, and you know I'd be given uh, uh, a lot of comments. Oh yeah, this works. Everything else, but they could never produce studies that showed they actually worked, and uh, and that was troubling to me. Um, but on the other hand, I guess I want to concentrate on the 15 million because we had this tobacco settlement and is all the money that is, was coming in and that tied up in litigation or where's that at? Um, I see that Mr. Berg is here too. Um, Ms. Moylan, and why don't you start and then Mr. Berg can give us the, the numbers if you don't have them. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Lean, and thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Um, so the tobacco settlement dollars, 3% um, of those settlements originally were, as part of the settlement, um, cre created Clearway, Minnesota. In addition to that 3%, we were given a 25-year lifespan. So we will sunset at the end of this year. That was just part of the settlement with that 3%. The other settlement dollars that will continue to come into the state go to the general fund and our, um, we'll continue to do that. It's about $150 million a year that comes into the state from um, the original tobacco settlement in 1998. Now, as I talked about with this separate settlement that's happening right now, is that in 2015, there was a merger between some tobacco uh, industries, some tobacco companies. And with that merger, there was the transfer of a number of popular brands like Cool, Winston, Salem, and Mavericks. Since 2015, neither company has paid the settlement payments attributable to those specific brands. So the state sued those tobacco companies for the settlement payments since 2015 on those specific brands. And currently now all parties are in negotiation, are in settlement negotiations for the delinquent settlement fees on those four or five brands. Representative Grunhagen. Okay, thank you. That that helps clear it up some, so. Thank you. And, and just on that point, uh, Ms. Moylanen, so you said the 3% of the settlement supported Clearway. And now when Clearway sunsets, is that 3% dropping to the bottom line and going into the general fund or what exactly happens to that 3%? Mr. Berg's shaking his head, but Ms. Moylanen, do you, can you uh, answer? Thank you, Madam Chair. The 3% that was originated, that, that was used to establish Clearway in Minnesota, that was about 200 million. And uh, through our investments over time, we have invested all of that into okay. 
tobacco prevention, tobacco treatment, um, awareness campaigns, uh, et cetera. And so that is now, um, well, most of it has been spent and invested in tobacco prevention and control in Minnesota. And um, we're gonna land that plane on the runway in time, on time. Okay, thank you. I misunderstood you, I guess. I thought you were saying that 3% ongoing was going to support Clearway, but no, clearly not. Okay, Mr. Berg, did you want to add anything before we go to Representative Ryer? Uh, Madam Chair, just to clarify, Ms. Moreland was correct on the numbers, basically. The state gets, as of this year, $153 million. It declines slightly. It's a declining revenue source. It declines by a couple of million dollars a year. That is unrestricted revenue to the general fund. It is not dedicated for any purpose. Members tend to think some part of the tobacco settlement the state gets is dedicated for tobacco cessation. Now it, that is not the case. Um, the other thing I would just emphasize is what you were just discussing with Moylan, Ms. Moylan and members tend to think that somehow Clearway is uh, affiliated with the state or somehow the state is giving them their money from our settlement. They are an independent nonprofit organization that was set up by the uh, original tobacco settlement. Their finances have nothing to do with the state of Minnesota, do not flow through the treasury, are not the state's money in any way. Um, just one final point is originally the state of Minnesota had three large endowments with the uh, a large uh, the corpus of the original uh, uh, settlement. Um, the state cashed those endowments in many years ago and they no longer exist. Okay, thank you, Mr. Berg. Ms. Moylan, and you look like you wanna add something to that. Are we good? Madam Chair, no, just okay. completely agree and, and appreciate that clarification. Okay. Great, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have a question that may be either for Representative Morrison or Ms. Moylan. And um, we have three good bills here. Um, one, again, and three alternative ways of funding tobacco, which I am completely committed to. So how are they interdependent? I, I, it makes a lot of sense to me to have multiple streams and attempts to see what actually makes it through. But I mean, if all three do, then um, we have an abundance there. How does that, how will you work through that? Or having none, I suppose, but we won't go there. Representative Morrison, do you wanna take a stab at it or ask Ms. Moylanen? Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Breyer. I'll take a stab and I'll let Ms. Moylanen add on, but you know, I think we're looking to find a way at the end in an omnibus bill to make sure that we have funding money available for tobacco prevention and treatment. Ms. Moylan, and I'll let you add on. Ms. Moylan. Madam Chair, Representative Ryer, that is correct. We wanted to provide uh, in partnership with uh, legislative leaders options to pursue and to consider. Um, and we were not putting out there the idea that more than one of these would be considered or finally included, but just again, wanting to really demonstrate that there are um, different solutions um, to get at this problem. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, other questions? I, I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, so just to talk for a moment about sort of process, um, since we don't have the second bill here, um, we're going to just lay over uh, House File 569 for possible inclusion in the finance bill. Um, the other sort of strategy, if it comes to us as a bill, it's fine. Uh, we don't need to hear it again. You've all heard it. Uh, we, you know, um, except maybe we may just bring it up quickly and lay it over for possible inclusion. But honestly, I don't even think that's necessary when we have, uh, when we go through our omnibus process, we could put that in as an amendment. I mean, the committee's had time to understand what it is. So there are lots of ways we can accomplish that goal to just to have these different strategies on the table. So a lot to think about this year. And, uh, you know, as as Representative Grunhagen pointed out on another bill, we, d we don't know what the budget is going to be. <laughs> you know, we, it could be that we have some surplus funds available, so-called surplus, since obviously we don't account for inflation in our budget. 
Uh, but, you know, we just don't know what situation we're going to be in. And this is very, very important. We don't, uh, I think most of us are pretty committed to the idea that we don't want to let our prevention efforts fall apart here when Clearway is gone. So um, with that, seeing no other discussion, Representative Morrison is going to renew her motion that House Bill 569 be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill, and the bill is laid over. Thank you. So members, uh, we're giving you actually 35 minutes of your life back here. And uh, I hope I hope you'll enjoy the extra 35 minutes, do something productive. I know you've all got plenty of work to do. So um, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs>